Good evening, everyone. It's 5.01 p.m. on Monday, June 14, 2021. And we're here tonight for the Hunt Zoning Board of Appeals uh, hearing. Uh, it's a continuation of a prior hearing uh, for um, 238 Wilson Road. And pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 38, Section 18, we are meeting via Zoom technology. And um, I think we're going to be pretty much ready to go. We already read the advertisement last time. And we um, are here again on a petition filed by um, Zenith Arend De Jong for, and Habitat for Humanity et al. for the property at 238 Wilson Road seeking dimensional variance or special permit to build a new residence in place of a demolished, fire-damaged original dwelling. The inspector of buildings had denied the building permit because of the property was in violation. I know I read this in full last time, so I won't go into it totally this time. Um, and otherwise, I think we're going to be pretty much ready to go. We had continued the matter so that we could ask the question of um, town council. And I did speak to attorney Dan Scripp, who was counsel for us and asked him the question whether there was any effect on the two-year reconstruction period based upon the uh, prior owner's application for a building permit that was never, that never um, was utilized. And he came back to us and said that there was no effect and that two-year period has in fact run and there are no more protections afforded to this property relative to uh, the nonconformity. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything else before we get started? We're uh, here this with my client, and I wanted to say that I appreciate the uh, inquiry and the response of the uh, of the council. I think that what we understood from the beginning is that uh, I hope the sins of the prior owner don't get visited on my clients, um, because I really don't know, and I think I said that at the last meeting, why it was that the individual who had the conflagration had the fire and then actually sought and got a building permit and then for some reason uh, didn't act timely and that led the inspector to uh, revoke that permit, but that we weren't looking to proceed based on the prior owner's action or inaction, but rather we recognize that the lot, uh, as the inspector says, when he uh, evaluated the request, obviously doesn't conform to many of the dimensional regulations now in effect in the town and the high, but that when the building was built in the 1920s, uh, before such regulations uh, existed, uh, it obviously conformed to the then regulations and thereafter was protected as a pre existing non conforming structure. I do think if you've seen the site, there's a portion that was left, and I don't know whether it was purposeful uh, of the original foundation. I know in my experience, I've had some people take a building down and, and retain a portion of it because they didn't want the land to lose whatever grandfather protection it may have been entitled to. And so they keep some portion of the old structure. Uh, we aren't proceeding on that basis. I think we were proceeding on the basis that uh, obviously we can't change the dimensions of the lot. We can't change the existing uh, dimensional regulations within the town, but we start with, we propose a use that is a permitted use in the district. It's a single family home. We also start with the premise that land obviously has its value and, uh, and its utility and what it can be used for. And the use of this land and the highest and best use of this land is as a residence, a single family residence. And I think the real question that then remains is what type residence and what uh, residents that was there, how should that affect my client's uh, proposals? And, and that's why he's here this evening, because I think he had a very simple approach. He said to me after the last hearing that, uh, you know, I hear what they're saying. And, and, I, and I understand what they're saying. Because I said to him, I said, I, I thought there was some misunderstanding uh, about what relief we were seeking and why we were seeking it or that there was some information that was not accurate, whether it was the height of the building or the front setback. And so rather than ask, obviously we know that the variance application process is not to change the zoning in a district, but to ask one to vary it and that we have a burden to show you why we think it should be. 
I would point out that the statute does say that conditions that owe to topography or shape are those uh, which are legitimate to be considered. I don't think proposing a single family dwelling of the type that we're about to present is a derogation uh, from the intent of the purposes of the zoning bylaw. And I don't think it is contrary to the public good to restore to the tax rolls in the town of Nahant and, and have a place be welcoming for somebody who wants to live in Nahant and uh, build a new uh, contemporaneous with the building code structure that would conform to the state building code. The question is, what can we do to satisfy the zoning? And at this point, I'm gonna stop talking because I think my client can best uh, advocate for himself, which is, I would say for me, a rare uh, exception because often I tell people don't speak unless I kick you. Uh, <laughs> but here, I'm gonna let him speak because he said to me, and I think the simplest terms, I heard them last time. I think I understand what they want. And he's done a little PowerPoint presentation, which would just take a few minutes. But I think at the end of it, essentially what he would hope you would conclude is that what he proposes is not dissimilar from what was there before, in some ways is improved, but is in no way larger or uh, more intense use than what had previously been there. So if I might, I would let him show you that PowerPoint, which compares the old dwelling his proposed dwelling, which he's made changes from, I would say from the plans that we originally filed, I know whether there was a concern about the parking space in the garage, there was a concern about the overhang, there was a concern about the height of the building. And I think if you see his presentation as I have, and you look at and compare what was there with what he proposes, then at least uh, he has given you the best information he has with respect to what it is he proposes and what he would hope that you would consider. Okay, excuse me, before we go any further, are you saying to us this evening that you are submitting a new plan tonight? Uh, I wouldn't say it's new. I'd say it was different than the previous plan in that we had heard from members there were some concerns about the garage, about the overhang. I don't think we ever proposed a building that was more uh, in elevation than the existing. And I do think that there's some confusion about what the front setback of uh, the prior home was and what we proposed. But yes, the, the, the PowerPoint presentation, I think, takes the old house and takes what's proposed. But as I understand it, and talk, we could speak to the three, I think the changes were in the, uh, the garage and the overhang. Yes. That, that's what I understand is the difference. Let me just make it really clear, though, that if there are changes to the plan, we would have to see the new plan and they have to be submitted also to the planning board and to the other town you know, board, the board of health, et cetera. Um, there's a 35 day review period for special permits that's required with an application. So um, in the event that there are new plans that involve a special permit, we would have to re you know, start this process pretty much over again. Um, so do you want to continue now? And we'll hit, 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 I, I would like to continue only because maybe it's my uh, misunderstanding, but we didn't add anything, we reduced. So that is a change I acknowledge, but it's not to the extent that we did something greater than what you saw. It's actually in two areas as I understand. Okay, let's hear the presentation so we can move on. Thank you, sir. Okay. Am I, could you allow me to share my screen? Can they hear you? Yep, we can hear them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Should be all set. Ah. Yep. So let's see if I can get this to work. And, and Mr. Dijon, just bear in mind that, you know, we, we all live in the hunt, and so we we're familiar with a lot of it. So yeah. I don't want to go too crazy. No, I'm not, I won't go crazy. No, no, no. It seriously is not crazy. So I just have listed the history, some of which you've already uh, heard, right? But the original house, 1920s, and then the destroyed by fire, demolished, rebuilt, permit applied for in July of 2019, and permit issued December, uh, the day after Christmas 2019. And I bought it on February 1st, the purchase and sale agreement. And you see on the right, the house after the fire. I think this is actually the, the, the most important slide to begin with. So uh, this is the, the plot plan that uh, uh, surveyor, uh, uh, Mr. Fayer. Yeah, Jack Fayer made. 
where on the left is the, exi the existing, what he calls existing, that has the original dwelling on it. And then on the right was my design that I put in uh, uh, for consideration. And you can see that there was two areas in that design that he marked in black here that were over where the original dwelling was. And I heard you loud and clear, I think last time that you were not interested in a larger building. I also heard some concerns about an additional deck. And I thought, well, I can either wait and go through this process or I can take proactive and see what we can do to change the design so it would fit the original dwelling. And so that's what we've done. We've made we've made the uh, the house smaller. We've pushed the garage in as well as the front door. We've taken that overhang out and so make it fit exactly within the footprint of the original house. So that takes that 3.8 foot on the right off and the three foot overhang on the right as well. And we remove that deck. Mr. Zhang, I just want to make it clear that no, at no time did we ever say that if this proposed property was within the original dwelling footprint, that it was going to be allowed. I totally so understand, sure that. understand that. I, no, it's I, a non-conforming <laughs> property no matter what you do. I, I totally understand that. And, okay. and I am also aware of that for, for the original dwelling, it would need a significant number of variances as well. So I, I, I understand it. Okay. I guess what I'm trying to show is though that I, I'm listening to what you're telling me and seeing if we if I can make it work one way or another, right? Okay, but we haven't told you anything yet. That's why I want to make sure that you understand that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, it may so my goal is to maintain the residential st status, uh, restore the original use. It peaks marginally lower than the original house. It takes a piece of the top floor off. Uh, uh, which would then improve uh, views to the neighbors. It includes an in-house garage. So where there was previously living space, I've actually put a garage, including a foundation in the design within the house, uh, parking in the attic, if you like, uh, as allowing for much safer road access. And then it's a design that goes rather well with the house next door, which is also a square kind of collection of boxes. Um, but this I think is where it gets interesting. So. You'll see on the left is, the, is a drawing of the original house. On the right is superimposed the design I proposed. And the, the, the light gray area is the outline of the original house. Uh, so you can see, for example, here on the right, the roof line of the original house sticks out further. Uh, the whole house fits within. There is a difference here where there's a little sloping roof in the original house. I've made that into a straight deck in the design. Uh, uh, but other than that, it fits in exactly. On the south elevation, this is, you'll remember this from the photo I just showed with the fire damage. Uh, that was the original house. Uh, and, and again, there's a dormer here on the right, you see, so the piece that we have uh, at the back fits within that dormer. Uh, and obviously we've lost the pitch, pitch roof uh, line. The other side elevation, uh, the same again. So. The gray is that is the original house superimposed on the new design. You can see the, the house set back a little further. The roof is lower here. And on the back, again, uh, you can see all the elevations exactly match. Uh, uh, this square piece fits within the dormer on the right here. And then this pitch roof is, is, is lost in this design. Um, and I, I, I hear you that there is no rights to this, but uh, uh, I wanted to show that I'm doing my best to try and work with the materials there. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's still in that adjusted program, still requires significant number of variances uh, 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 with the building code, uh, but which were also needed for that rebuild permit that you granted, right? So that's uh, uh, that, that was my homework while you were doing your homework. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. That was it. Okay, so at this point in the hearing, um, does anyone have any questions for the petitioner? No? Uh, Jocelyn, I have a question. The answer that we got from uh, Dan Skip, can you, can you put in layman's terms what he said? What he said is that the two year period for reconstruction is gone. Any which, be, which, which means? Which means that any protections afforded for the non conformity is completely gone. Okay. So they're not allowed to build as of right under the footprint. They're not allowed to do anything. They'll need a variance um, for almost everything that they're doing in, on this property. Okay, to build new 
um, and a non-conforming lot with non-conforming setbacks, we're going to need variances for all of these items. So the fact that there's a foundation means nothing. Means, means nothing. Okay. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay. He made that very clear. So I'm not part of tonight's panel, but uh, if you'll entertain the input, the the clarification is that basically the inaction on the previous permit takes the applicant back to a situation as if this were bare land and if he were applying for a building permit to do new construction from the ground up. Yeah, uh, duh. Right? Yeah. It can't be the first time that ever happened. No more comments from anyone, please. And so we're ready for comments. Thank you. All right, so that's the, um, that's the status of where we are today. Is under, in our bylaws, are there any limits to the number of variances that can be allowed on a residential piece of property? Um, no. Are you aware of any limits? I'm not aware of any no. limits. But no. usually, okay. you know, we, we're lucky to allow one or two at the most, but. Right, that's, I, I just wondered if there was a number that was out there. We, okay. We essentially would have to take each of the seven, if, if there's still seven, and, and handle them separately. Or look so at them separately. We deliberations now, because before we do that, Peter, I wanted to make sure I, I asked all the questions. Yep. So yep. the next question we had, if we didn't have any more questions for the board right now, from the board right now, is to see if there's anyone in, in present who would like to speak in favor of the application. Is there anyone present? There are two people listed who are not speaking. Is there anyone like to speak in favor? I'll, I'll speak in favor. I'm the um, okay. architect designer of working with R and D owner. Excuse me, sir. Could you state your name and your address? And do you live yes. in the Hunt? I do, do not. Live in the Hunt. Do you live in the Hunt? No, I do not. Okay, I well, uh, live in. Only take um, names of people who you know comments of people usually who live in the in the Hunt. Understood. Okay. Isn't that right, everybody? Am I wrong about that? We only usually no. get people who live in the hunt. Is that right, Peter? Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's correct. I mean, as the architect, if you wanted to uh, right. put input in. Yeah. 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 We'd be happy to hear from you. Okay. I just, yeah, my name is Graham Salzberg. Um, I live in Marblehead and um, I worked very closely with Aaron DeYoung on. on um, very familiar with the the process that he's gone through and purchasing the property, and uh, worked uh, very very closely with him to sort of make this this house um, conform to whatever. I know I understand I understand what we've learned thus far as far as uh, the exemption or uh, not being able to build on the original footprint, but we. In any case, we've worked very, very hard to try and make it fit within the same exact footprint. Uh, if that were, uh, you know, if it were as a right to be able to do that, I understand it's not. But I just wanted to say that uh, we we were sensitive not just to the, the property and the footprint, um, but also to the neighbors and height, uh, trying to maintain uh, the the original view corridors, if not improve them by lowering the, the ridge line. Um, and some of the massings, um, and also in materiality, you know, um, we've looked um, at some of the neighboring properties and um, and didn't want to do anything that uh, made it stand out. Um, and we worked really, really hard to kind of make it fit in with the fabric of the um, the vocabulary of the neighborhood in the haunt. And um, Aaron and I also also are friends, and <clears throat> we we bike in the haunt um, almost bi-weekly and we love we love the community there and we love the, the scenery and the people and um he's very interested in becoming part of that community and so um we're just putting our best foot forward and that's basically all i want to say well, thank you very much is there anyone else who'd like to speak um i'm actually in favor of the property in favor of the petition or is there anyone who'd like to speak in opposition to the um application and petition tonight Two other people who are present but aren't speaking. Um, all right, so we're going to close out the hearing for anyone who would like to speak in opposition, unless they say so now. Okay, 
So we're going to move on to our deliberations, and that's when we talk amongst ourselves. If we have questions for you or your counsel, we'll let you know. Okay? All right. So one thing I'm concerned about is, first of all, we've got a presentation for presentation for a new, basically a new building, and we don't have all of the dimensional requirements um, laid out for us for that. That's one concern I have. Another concern I have, I'll just put my concerns out there if anybody else wants to add their own, is that, um, you know, we're not supposed to be allowing nonconformities in perpetuity. I think this is one of those cases where, you know, if there's any hardship on this property, it's self-imposed. Um, and that I think this, this applicant is actually in a purchase and sale agreement, not technically the owner yet. Uh, probably contingent upon this, I'm guessing. And... Um, I think they're asking for too much. My, my, what does everybody else think? You know, I'm, I'm kind of concerned in the exact opposite direction that we're almost going to essentially say that a property that was extremely valuable four years ago is now due to, you know, what's happened over the last few years, essentially worthless. Um, I don't know that that strikes me in an odd way that that's essentially the case if we don't have any ability to grant some relief. Um, and frankly, I'm not I'm not convinced that that there aren't pathways to um, granting relief or or arguing that you no know, structure can be built on this property again. Now you cannot build a conforming structure on this property essentially right so it puts you in a position of it's either worthless or there's a path to some sort of relief or some sort of argument that you know you don't need all of that relief um why is the value any of our concern max why is the value any of our concern well i mean our concern is supposed to be the the bylaws and the, the non-conformities and the light and the air and well because we live in a town full of non-conforming structures right and probably we all probably live in non-conforming structures and and the and the and the tax the tax roll relies on taxing of non-conforming structures so i know that zoning is is set up in such a way to um, that that non-conforming structures are not supposed to happen in perpetuity, but that's that's sort of a myth, you know. That's not the reality that we all live in. Um, we're not moving towards a nahat that is made up of mostly conforming structures. That's that's not true. Um, and I'm I'm not convinced that that this is even under 40A and our bylaw. Um, you know, not a viable, a viable lot, frankly. Okay. Anybody else want to add to the deliberations? Yeah, the question I got, is there anything that could be built on this property that does not require variance? Are there, are there any, I mean, I, we, we're looking at seven variants here. What could be built on this property that would be conforming? Anything? A pretty narrow house. Pretty narrow house. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you if you get going to ten uh, ten uh, foot side setbacks, it'd mm -hmm. be a pretty narrow house. You, you could eliminate that one. Um, the front setback. Yeah. Again, right? Yeah, it's fifteen point seven now. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Nineteen point five, I think, is the old. Five. Yeah. So, so, so you could eliminate one by making it a half a foot uh, smaller for the setback, the Wilson Road side. Well, the front setback is supposed to be twenty five. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm thinking 20. I'm sorry. Okay. So my, my point being, it's, it's impossible to build on this piece of property without 
granting variances. So if we don't grant any variances, we've taken a piece of property that's probably worth seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars, and we've decided that it's worth nothing. Well, the prior owner decided that they took they probably took the insurance money if there was any, pocketed it, and then donated the house. I don't know what that, I'm assuming that's what they did. I don't have any idea. We understand the current, the current, the current technical owner is Habitat for Humanity, and that the applicant is a uh, somebody has a purchase and sale agreement. Is that right? Correct. And the actually, the owner of the property is Essex Habitat for Humanity and the Gordon Cornwell Theological Seminary Inc. Okay, both nonprofits, basically. Right. And, and so, uh, assuming that nothing of substance can be built on the property then we are facing a situation where potentially strict enforcement of the zoning regulations will cause the property to be barren and therefore potentially create an incentive for whoever is the owner basically to walk away from it because it has no uh, economic profit. Unless they sold it to neighbors or something like that. Or, and here is the stretch, it's Gordon. Okay. Is it North? If it's Gordon College, uh, Gordon they could, Theological Seminary, they could they could they could pull the Dover Amendment and build whatever they want. As long as it meets the dimensional requirements, they they must adhere to a dimensional requirement under the Dover Amendment. That's right, and they also would have to use it for nonprofit purposes under the Dover Amendment. Right. Educational purposes, not hey, Yes, correct. Thank you, Peter. Are you saying you want a college to build? A school I don't. on the ocean in the hot? Is that what you're saying? I, <laughs> oh. yeah. No, no, I'm just... I'm Because that's like the worst thing in the world. I... <laughs> I... Uh, no, I, 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 I have to kind of agree with Max and David. I mean, you know, and this... I'm almost wondering if we would have any input from the planning board on this, but we're essentially taking tax dollars away from the town and creating i don't think our job here is to protect the zoning bylaws so much that we create a vacant lot and that's essentially what we would be doing and don't get me wrong i know that the the previous owners made huge mistakes they took the money and ran but we're going to be stuck with a vacant lot and less tax dollars coming in from this piece of property. Wasn't there a letter from the planning board on this that I read at the last state? I think there was. I'm trying to, yeah, look through my old files. I mean, yeah, I thought there was. But. Well, while, you all are there looking was. Through, while you all are looking through that, let me, let me offer a, a thought. And I, I'm analogizing this situation to the situation of flood insurance, which is a federally driven program. But the, the thrust of flood insurance programs is to force the is to, to impose upon coastal landowners the requirement to pay commercial insurance rates for flood insurance, which are very much abo ab above the current rates. And essentially, one by one, property by property, drive out the existing properties in the floodplain so that we would essentially have a floodplain that is free of properties and therefore free of the need of flood insurance. Now that's, that's, that's a problem that's going on in fits and starts, but we need to ask ourselves, is there a similar incentive on the part of our zoning bylaw? In other words, to drive out non-conforming properties in these tightly spa packed spaces of Little Nahant. Yeah, but it, it'd be one thing if, if this gave us some sort of relief. I mean, okay, it gives two neighbors relief and maybe, you know, a few houses on the backside. But this isn't really, I mean, where it's located, it's, I don't know that it makes that much of an impact, to be honest. I, I totally understand what you're getting at, but I, I don't know. And what about I, the idea that, Peter, what about the idea that um, we don't even have you know, the final plans from what he's suggesting tonight. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We don't have that. We need to have, we're supposed to have the final plans 
that you right. that we're voting on, and we don't have those. So it's a little hard to. Yeah, because because the other thing is we did have a um, we did have a neighbor that spoke um, against because the house was going to be bigger, and I if I re recall correctly, he did say something like, you know, if he was building the same size house, I wouldn't have a problem. And I mean, maybe that's where else is coming from. Huh? I mean, if the, if the prop, if the house were designed so that the first floor, meaning down bottom, were on stilts, then you would get rid of the problem of being in the flood zone. Would you really though? You're still in the flood zone. Well, you're in the no, flood but, zone, but you're not floodable. Not in you're not floodable when you get right. when you're on stilts. Yeah. What about the FEMA regulations? I mean, this is a, I, a reconstruct. I, I think what we need to if I could just interject, I think what we need to do is I've been told that because of the elevation of the lot, that it is not in the flood zone. But I mean, the, the, every community has what's called community panels that are put out uh, by the FEMA uh, and the agencies charged with the regulation of uh, construction. And uh, if, if it were, in fact, there, like on Plum Island, for example, many of the buildings built there are within the floodplain and are required by FEMA regulations um, to be raised above the the level of the floodplain, which often puts boards of appeals like you in the predicament of you may have a height restriction. And so somebody comes in and says, well, FEMA says I have to raise the building up four feet. And if I do, then I'm going to violate your height regulation. So part of this is to make it work. Uh, we certainly don't have a problem with submitting the plan that we propose, uh, trying to make it conform. But I really think the essence of the question was raised by a couple of members, which is, and I said at the outset, and maybe I didn't make it clear, land has its value and its utility. What could it be used for? Now, if we found a discovered oil or uranium on this site, then the highest and best use would be a uranium mine or a, an oil one. But that's, that's not right, it. Tally, it thank it's you in for a your residential comments, district but... where a single family is a permitted use. What's being proposed is a permitted use. We can't make the lot bigger. We can't change the dimensions of the lot. And we have tried to conform by dealing with the size of the building. But at the end of the Mr. day- Mr. Vitale, have you, have you tried to minimize the extent of the variances that you're requesting? Has that exercise been done? I think we have, when the problem we have is to, to make it a living space, to make a living space- Anyone that looked at it from- You understand that a dwelling has to have a bathroom, I do understand that. It has to have a bedroom and it has to have a kitchen and the kitchen has to have a stove and a sink. So What's the square footage of the proposed structure? So in, in, in terms of working with what makes it a dwelling unit, um, and the other is that we thought we made an improvement with respect to the parking by eliminating what we thought was a dangerous situation with the line of sight and the cars that were parked in the past closer to the roadway. And that's why we decided to incorporate a, uh, a garage. But uh, we can't make the lot bigger. And so that's, we can't increase the size of the frontage. We can only deal with, and we don't have the authority to change what the table of dimensional regulations is. So our relief is to ask you to that. make a variance, Tally, if you we, would. We get that, we understand that, okay? We do, we all understand that part of it, thank you. We're in the middle of our deliberations. Um, and if we have any more questions, we'll let you know. All right, so uh, Russell, what do you want to do? Russell, let me, a couple of questions. One, has uh, the CONCOM had any comments regarding this? Well, we have the, con the order of conservation, uh, order of conditions. And I have, first of all, I haven't heard um, from anyone regarding, again, regarding the FEMA that I decided to talk about before we were interrupted um, and, and the 50% rule for that. I mean, we're not even, we're, we're voting to reconstruct a property, you know. Um, but anyway, everybody got the order of condition that was in the package that I sent out to everyone. Um, yeah, and I found the letter from the planning board. And I did read that on the last date. Can you, yeah. uh, Peter, can you tell us what the planning board said? 
Yeah, so this letter shares the planning board's comments on the above uh, captioned appeal to the ZBA, um, which is 238 Wilson Road. We understand that the previous house was destroyed by fire January 1st, 2018, so that this application does not meet the timing requirement of 7.03D uh, and therefore cannot be rebuilt as a matter of right. The planning board believes that the intent of 7.03D is to bring lots and structures more into conformance with zoning bylaws over time. Also, the application does not contain a complete description of the prior structure. The planning board has concerns over the number of variances being requested and that uh, result in a house that is overall very large relative to lot size. Respectfully submitted town planning board. All right. I mean, there's a couple of- Do you of want to suggest that they withdraw and give us a new application if they're going to do one? Because we don't even have the plans to vote on. So how are we going to do that tonight? Right, right. I, I do think we need, I do think we need actual plans, not changed plans. But I think also uh, there, there's a couple of issues. You brought up the 50% rule. What are we basing? Is it even in the flood zone though? Is the, is the property even in the flood zone? No. no. Well, well, it is. He's saying no. It is no. So if it's not in the flood zone, then there's no 50% rule. He, Michael brought up the flood zone as an analogy, not, not as a... Matter of fact, yeah. That's correct. That's but correct. I don't, if, if, it, if it were, we don't even know what to base the 50% on because there's nothing there. He, well, it would he be, would never get a building permit even if we gave approval if he if it violated the 50% rule. I mean, there's not even a 50% rule. This this structure would have to be built compliant with FEMA compliant. regulations, no matter what permission we granted. So I don't I don't see that as a major issue. And we and we do know that it's not in the floodplain. I don't know that, but I don't think it really matters that much. In other words, I think somebody it's, else is going to make that determination. Oh, oh, con con. I applied for flood insurance. It was told not needed, not in the flood zone. I can send you the documentation and with the flood map. It's in a, it's in an X zone. It is in the X zone after looking at the, gov the government FEMA maps. Jocelyn? X zone. Jocelyn, Dave McCool here. Look, I just wanted to find out my question is this. What if anything could have been done to once the um, the homeowner prior, prior homeowner applied for and received a building permit and they didn't commence construction within the two year period is there anything they could have done to reserve rights um you know make an application for extension is there anything they could have done to protect their rights immaterial now because they have no rights they're gone they no longer right. own the property they didn't build on it. The two years lapsed. It's all done. I checked on that with Dan Scott. Okay. That's the reason I called him. Right. It absolutely right. did nothing left. But they could have. Yes. Dave was asking, could they have done? They could have. They could have come to the zoning board and sought an extension of the, the two-year period. period, but they didn't. Okay. Okay. You're right. Yeah. And I, I would go back to uh, Jocelyn, what you said. I would suggest that uh, the petitioners come back to us with an actual plan of a building that is exactly as it's, they're looking to build. And at the same time, I would suggest that you try to reduce the variances or at least the dimensions of the variances as they uh, will affect this property. In other words, you, yeah, you may have to scale it down a bit, but you have a better chance of getting seven variances passed. Hopefully, there wouldn't be seven variances. But yeah, if you got a better chance really of getting five. That if, they, if, if the applicant does get five or four, if or the whatever. applicant does do that, it's based upon your suggestion or whatever. It's based, I say only because he put the presentation forth on his screen. But that we're not required to accept it, and we may not, we may vote right. against it at that time, we may vote for it, we don't know. But we, right now, we're not, we don't have anything we can vote on tonight. Is that, is everybody in that agreement? Because what, what they're asking for right now in the paperwork is too much. Is that what everybody's in agreement with? Well, we don't have the, 
I think we don't have the we don't have an actual we don't have an right, we don't have the, pro, the actual plan so we don't know what the floor area ratio is going to be we don't know what the you know we know some of these will stay the same the width obviously uh, but we don't know what the front setback is going to be right so that means actually an we do an application so, needs to go through Wayne with all of those parameters so that he can evaluate them correct we can do that. Yeah, it needs it needs to definitely um, uh, plans need to be resubmitted, and, and I, I kind of agree with David that you know if you can reduce some of the variances, then it might be, um, you know. So with the choices are, Mrs. Young is really if everybody's in agreement with this, tell me now. I got David McCool, Peter Max, David Walsh. We, we feel like we, what you're asking for right now in the paperwork that we have, that what you have then modified, <clears throat> that paperwork as it sat would have been probably too much if we were to vote on it. I'm just guessing. Um, but if you, they're suggesting that if you wanted to bring in, submit new plans, that they'll be considered. Is that what everyone's saying? Yeah. I am. Yes. And what's the, what's the exact process? Back, back to yes. the building permit that gets rejected and then back to the ZBA? Or can I, can I propose a plan directly to you? Do we, do we, not directly to us, it'd have to go to the building inspector. But here's a question, Jocelyn. Would we be able to continue, continue this hearing with, you know, to wait on a set of new plans? I can have the plans done in days. It's well, like, that's one thing that we have to think about because if the plans change considerably, do we need to re-notify the abutters? I don't know, but my instinct would be yes. Yeah. Yep. I think I think um, Michael's right. We need a new application. Well, the point is that they, there's nothing to be gained by having a situation where some abutter could claim to have been prejudiced by not not being notified of the parameters of the new plans. So I don't know what the requirements are. I haven't studied them in, in, in precision, but it would seem to me that requiring new notice to the abutters would save the, the risk of what I just described. Spare the risk. I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I think that they've applied for relief on this property. It's been notified. There's been two meetings that would be continued and they would be supplying additional modified plans that are seeking less relief than what was originally requested. Um, I don't think there's an issue with that unless the, the only thing I'm not sure about is the, the other board's input. I, I've never had my head wrapped around that process at all. Um, so I don't know how much opportunity they need I don't, I mean, that, that's a, that's a mess, but. but. Yeah, it is because a lot of, you know, the most towns don't do that. Most yeah. Most towns don't do that 35 day thing. I don't know why we, we are, but. Well, because the law says that, as you know, under chapter 11, I think is it, section 11, it says that if we are going to have the other boards look at things, we have to give them up to 35 days. Now, for example, Marblehead, and I think Swampscott too, you, you're in Swampscott, so you would know, they don't do that. They let the board see the stuff, but they have to, I don't know, it's like probably they have their own time period, whatever it be. Whatever it be. But that's why our, our petitions take so long. So the question is, do we need to, uh, do we want to offer that the applicant withdraw and reapply, or do you want to offer the uh, continuance? Um, my feeling is that if he withdraws and reapplies, it would go in front of planning again, and planning would have a chance to look at it and maybe more favorable on the fact that he's tried to reduce the issues, the seven issues. Um, I, I'm just, I'm thinking the full process, process helps the owner more than hurts it. If that's something I can, you know, suggest. In other words, withdraw and renew. Yeah. It, it no, I, I, I think we're fine with with continuing and waiting for a new set of plans. However, I think giving the planning board a chance to look at it, giving well, we neighbors give them a copy. 
giving neighbors notification and a chance to speak, I, my opinion is I think it only helps the owner more than hurts the owner. I think we could leave it up to them too, though. I mean, they, right. they could almost take the risk of seeking the continuance, um, knowing that that could impact people on this board's feeling about it. It could impact the ability of an abutter to appeal it. But, you know, ultimately it's their yeah, petition, yeah. right? It's their risk to, to bear. Because um, I, I think both ways sort of have merit. I mean, if you continue it, it's going to be quicker. If you withdraw and reapply, it's going to take longer, but it's it's probably safer for them. Um, from the, you know, our, from the board's perspective, the ability to hear the planning board chime in, the ability of abutters to complain about it. And, but Or not. <laughs> or not, right? But yeah. I, I think both are viable options that maybe they can Maybe why, why not let them pick, right? Yeah. Yep. And the advantage, the other advantage as far as the board goes is if they withdraw it and it goes out a period of a month or two or whatever, that you don't have to have the same members hearing it again. Right. Yeah. And, right. and I think Jocelyn does make a really good point that just because we're saying you can do this doesn't bind us to anything down the road. Right. Uh, and that's important to note that we don't have enough to really review right now. Yes, we think there may be pathways to some approval theoretically, but you can't hold your hat on that either. So it's it's touchy. So it looks like that is everybody everyone here in agreement that you want to give them an option, give the applicant an option? We don't usually yeah. do that, but I don't see why we couldn't. Why not? Dave McCool, are you okay with that? Yes, yes, I'm okay. Going on another couple months. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. If it's a continuance, I'll be around. I'll figure it out. I think we'll so figure it out. Thank you. All right. So, um, Attorney Vitale and Mr. Jujon, what they're saying is, is that you do you want to continue this matter, um, and for a period of time, we'll give you a time frame once you tell us, and you can do the new plans, and we'll try and get them to the planning board and the butters, give people a chance to respond. Um, or do you want to withdraw and start over with the full process, which tends to be a little safer because then we re-advertise. Um, so it's up to you. My, my council says probably go for the slow route and, and withdraw and re-advertise. You'll get different members probably at that in that sense too because some of these members, for example, Dave McCool's going off the roster, Someone else might not be available. So. Yeah. So I think we'll withdraw and then we'll we'll reapply, but it'll be very soon. If we may have a difference in opinions, we may not need as many members. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mr. Dijon, may I just one question. Is he kicking you? <laughs> no, I didn't kick him. I can't tell you. I can't absolutely can't tell you. <laughs> well, you're doing the job I going for you. I, I always knew this was a difficult property when I first saw it. I, I always knew that. I knew I was be, I was going to be in for the long haul. I, uh, I, I just want to find a way to make it work. So I'd, I'd rather take it back, uh, come back with a drawing that I think makes for a nice house as well as uh, satisfy some of your wishes and, and see whether we can get that going. That that would be the best, I think. Okay. Do we need a motion now for this to accept the withdrawal? Okay, I'll make a motion that... We accept the applicant's withdrawal of this petition. Uh, seconded um, by Pete Barber. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, all in favor? David Walsh, aye. Pete Barber, aye. David McCool, aye. Max Casper, aye. aye. And Jonathan Campbell, aye. All right. And that's uh, withdrawal without prejudice, right? That's the correct that's the proper term. term yeah. <laughs> Let me let me just interject one thing, if I may, even though I'm not on the panel this time. Um, to the extent that we're going to put this in front of the planning board again, is there a mechanism and does it make sense to flag to the planning board the concerns that we identified? In other words, that if this property is functionally unbuildable, 
is it the intent in the view of the planning board that the zoning bylaw have the effect of making the property basically turning it into a vacant lot such that its only value is for let's say sale to a neighbor uh, or run the risk that the existing owner will let it turn into a uh, you know a, a weed lot yeah i mean uh, the planning board has nothing to do with that the only thing I can say about that. I mean, and, and, and Michael's concern is, is real because right now that lot, I, I've driven up there, it's concrete and weeds. Yeah. And if we say, you know, nothing can be done there, it's going to remain concrete and, and weeds. Uh, Not necessarily, Peter. And if I, the property becomes really decrepit, the town can bring a complaint against it and can put a. I, I understand you know. that, but that's. Well, but that's going to be against a couple of nonprofits, right? <laughs> exactly. And the, the town has never been very good at that. <laughs> well, and so let's say the town the town brings a complaint and ends up taking it for tax liabilities, right? Then what the hell is it going to do with it? Right. We, then we it's have in to take everyone's care of interest for something and the right thing to eventually be there. You know. Right. And my, my point is this, this may require a rethinking of some provision of the zoning bylaws. And I'm right. not saying that, this, that, that, that the action on that necessarily lies in the mouth of the planning board, but there are certainly somebody who's in a position to propose a, a, a mechanism to be embedded in a new version of the zoning bylaw that would deal with this situation, which seems to be something that nobody has thought of or dealt with before, right? Right. I, I'm assuming this is something new. Yeah, it's all you gotta do is get rid of variances and make everything a special permit and you have that mechanism. There you go. Seriously, that's how other that's how Marblehead does it. It really is. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're we're almost there. All right, so we we've accepted the motion. And does anybody want to bring a motion to adjourn? Uh no, I've got a question. Okay. I've got something separate that I just want to bring up, but I don't want to adjourn quite yet. Go ahead. What okay. <laughs> what would the mechanism be since we've had it happen a couple of times recently on a private home that wants to turn into a into condos? Is there a mechanism right now or can there be one by by bylaw or whatever that there a requirement would need to be go before the planning board and the zoning bylaw before a property can be accepted to turn into condos. Condos are a form of ownership. I mean, it has nothing to do with, with zoning, unless you were trying to go from one, one dwelling unit to two dwelling units. That's, cool. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, but it certainly is something that's subject to the, to the, to the power the zoning power and the fact that we don't address it now doesn't mean that we cannot. Certainly plenty of other municipalities have provisions one way or another, whether it be in the form of a zoning bylaw or something else that, that uh, impose requirements or, or prohibitions on uh, condominiums. And it seems to me that the, the, the thing we dealt with last week brings us into focus. So it, it's, a, it's a timely thing to consider revamping the zoning law, or at least some bylaw of the town, to deal with the provision of people who want to go to condos, right? Can I ask you that? Because I think Max raised the, the right point at the beginning. It's usually about use. And I go into other communities, I work in some zoning matters, and I see it's always, always about use. It's not about, it's a form of ownership, right? That the condominium piece. And it's all, you take a two family house and you turn it into two condos. As long as you meet the requirements of the parking, square footage, and the other, the zoning relief, zoning uh, by parameters, <laughs> that's what you're looking at. Well, what is it that prevents people from turning uh, every building into an apartment house? That must be a provision. Because you're not allowed to have two families in the hut. Then you only can have them if they are pre existing, not conforming. Well, that's another way to get it at condoization. I think Jocelyn's hit it right on the nose. It's we have a lot of control with use. Um, zoning's hard enough to to try and regulate how people are deeding the property. I I don't even think it, it's within our bounds. Honestly, I really don't. I don't think we have any choice. Big over it. 
there are some people who are trying to regulate it, Max, though. And, but what about the fact that, like, the last two that we did, that we were involved in, not we did, we were involved in, those were already pre-existing two families. Yep. So yep. they want to they turn it into condos as long as they have the right parking per, for each unit that they need, right? And I don't even think they need the parking. I think if it's an existing two-family... If it's owned by one person and they want to change it so it's owned as condos, they don't even need the parking. I really don't think so. So what you're saying, what you're saying, Max, is the property we dealt with last week on, on Bass Point Road would be illegal if it were done as apartments, but it is legal to do as condos, correct? No, it was already oh. a two family. It was already two. Right, it's already a two-family. So, what what prevents somebody from taking what's an existing one family and dividing it up into condos? Let's say it's got multiple stories. Can't do that. Zoning prevents that because right. that would be a change of use from a single-family to a two-family, right. and a two-family use wouldn't be permitted in that in that instance. Right. Well, is it two-family or is it two condos? It's your. It's a two, like it's a, you have to think of the use of the building. Right. And condos is, is, is how you own it. If you have a two family owned by one person, it's a two family. If you have a two family that is two separate condos owned by two people, it's still a two family structure. It's just owned by two different people as condos. Well, I guess my point is we need to be careful of a situation where somebody can gain some advantage by changing the form of ownership. So they get an advantage that way that they could not do if it were owned by a single owner. Yeah, Michael, we've run into this in the past almost, uh, well, and maybe a different way. We had, we've had people come in, you know, and they wanna um, build a garage. Next thing you know, you drive by and there's an apartment up above it, you know? <laughs> so right. Next thing well, you I mean, know, that... they come in and they wanna subdivide, you know, and sell it. That's right. And, and I mean, the, the, what you just described is a, the, uh, the added garage turns into an, a new apartment. That's exactly the kind of thing that zoning is designed to prevent or at least limit to provide control over. Uh, that's what we, we, we say no to it. So. Yeah, well, okay, but I, 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 my point is we need to make sure that there is not a, an easy end around the restrictions that the zoning bylaw provides by simply changing the form of ownership. And I'm not but sure- But I don't think there is, other than just, it creeps in on you. But as long as you are there strong to defend against it, it doesn't the give use. them additional rights. Right, the use is key. That We have to stick with the use. Because once we start changing that use, that's when you open it up, Michael, for the condominium. So the use is, the use, we need to be careful about this. The use, that pre-exists is pertinent to an entire structure and not to a, a, a an ownership unit. Is that right? right? right. Yeah. And is there something that says that that is so, that that's the way it needs to be analyzed? Oh, the bylaws say it. Maybe not the so the, the use as to a, an individual building, which is capable of supporting multiple units, stays with that building in, in spite of whatever division that the owner makes in it. Yeah, if you look at the, if you look at the houses along Nahant Road, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, just past Captain's Pizza, you yeah. have, you know, you used to have the, the, the fish store in there and, and the uh, dry cleaners and, and above it, there are apartments. Those are multifamily. Now, we've given uses of a fish store and a, you know, and a, um, a cleaner, dry cleaner as a use. Yeah. Uh, if they wanted to take that and put in condos, say, you know what, I want to sell these units. And instead of having a fish store in the first floor, we're going to put a condo there. We're going to put a condo on the second floor and a condo on the third floor. That'd be a it's change a, of use. It'd be a change of use. So they'd have to come in front of us. Right, but if you took two two houses up, two buildings up, if you took a three family there, yeah. and turned it into three condos, they wouldn't have to come in front of us. Correct. They don't have right. to come because it's three dwelling units now, and it's going to be three dwelling units in the future. 
Right. Okay, so, so my point is what happens is when you do that, you end up having to sometimes change uh, in egress, ingress, things of that sort, because each one now is its own entity. And not, you know what I'm saying? That's so, a building. Wouldn't that be building it, department? To make matters? it conform. Yeah, I think, you know, the building yeah, to make it needs to be protecting against things that, that we are protecting against as well. He's like the front lines, right? Yeah. Right. So, so in other words, say, if you have that three-story building and I've been in it, and now you want to make each one separate, you've got to create new egress and ingress for part of the of the of the building. Because not, not now necessarily. It depends on the through. yeah. Now you can't walk through somebody else's property to get to your third floor condo. Right, but you yeah, would have already had through to have somebody had else's that. property, it might have not been a three family to begin with, you know. So right, right. I agree. Yeah. It, you would have already common, all these common would have already been I just, you know, it, maybe this is, you know, too, too technical. I just think that um, I, what I saw from Bass Point Road, I see, you know, architects and owners doing the same thing here. It's happening everywhere. All over I agree the state. with David's concern, and and I'm not, sure, I'm not I'm not sure that we we have we are have especially vulnerable to manipulation of the kind that we're talking about. However. I'm pretty confident that other towns and other municipalities will have uh, condoization bylaws that um, are, are extrinsic to the kind of provisions that we have in our bylaw. So I'm wondering whether it makes sense to take a look at what other towns do uh, to, to figure out why they did it, you know, because they could obviously go the, take the route that we have taken. And uh, obviously they've decided not to and decided to add an additional condoization provision, right? So we so should I've probably been figure out- I've that for a long time, Michael. I'm and sorry? I think it'd be great. I've been thinking about that for a long time. Um, I wish that we had, you know, why can't we form a committee that would make suggestions on by, by law improvements? I mean, there's got to be there's got to be literature on this process, you know, on, on the, the lessons of various other municipalities Here's why they did it. Here's the the problem that they encountered, and and we ought not to be blind to those uh, those learnings, right? Oh, no, I, I also I, mention one more thing before I forget. That is, somebody asked last time about the training, and I contacted them, and they're looking for someone who can do it for us via Zoom, hopefully. Oh, good. So, yeah, so we're gonna, that's in the work. So, Mike, just so you know, I I I've been sitting on this board probably too long. Um, I go back to Paul Morris, who sat on the original committee, I think, to help create the original zoning bylaws. And if I recall correctly, that's exactly what they did, was they looked at other communities, other towns. Um, I think that, you know, Marblehead was probably something that they used because of the, you know, oceanfront community, small town type thing, old, older buildings. Uh, but that's what they did. They basically took some of these bylaws and they, you know, kind of stole stole them from other places. And you know, well, they they may have done that, and they may have done a good job at the time based on the the learning and the state of the market and so forth at the time. My understanding is the last major revision of the bylaws was in 1990 when Carolyn Cummings Sachs was involved and the height limitation was imposed. Now maybe you're thinking of something more recent than that. But no, this was it. This was good. This goes go back to the 80s when when Paul Morrison and that crew basically put together the bylaws. Right. Our, by, well, our bylaws are not that old. Right. He told me that he told me that they copied them from Weymouth. Not right. Weymouth. Oh, that's, yeah. No, no. Is yeah. it Weymouth? No. Winthrop. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, God bless them and, and, and all, you know, hats off to them for what they did at the time based on what the circumstances were. But it seems to me there are probably things that it would be worth our while to look at to see if they uh, offer anything that we ought to consider. That's really all I'm saying. Maybe the answer is no. Maybe we conclude that everything we've done right now is cutting edge sophistication mm -hmm. and should be left as it is. But uh, it seems to me to be perhaps not the most prudent thing to assume that we've got cutting edge provisions and that we're not leaving anything lying on the table. 
No, we don't have cutting edge for anything. Yes, <laughs> there's nothing in the hunt that's cutting edge, <laughs> except, except for maybe a few Teslas that people own. Right. You know, you gotta, you gotta remember, I watched, I watched this happen in Somerville, all right? A, a, a three family in Somerville that was worth $400,000. Once it turned into condos, the condos were worth a million apiece. Wow. And the town and the city went for it because the tax rate on each yep. condo, you know, was tripling the taxes they were getting on a three on a three uh, family. Well, that's a civic decision, and yeah. that you know that, that that makes sense from a fiscal standpoint, but it may not please the adjoining uh, landowners, and and that's really the purpose of the of the zoning bylaw to make sure that there is a measure of control about uh, you know wildfire type development, right? Right, and, and what I'm saying is that this town, which never has any money anyways, could start allowing something like this. And, you know, we, if we don't have regulations around it. It could know, get, our, 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 our financial planners could get addicted to it, you know? Right. Exactly, exactly. Can I make a suggestion? So, yes. well, this, like I said, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. What if I were to appoint a committee, to think of the chair, I can do that, right? A committee, of two or three of us to start working on bylaws. And then I want to say, that's just one idea, put that aside. The other thing is, is that um, a long, not a long time ago, but like about maybe six months or a year ago, I was searching for some Bobrowski materials. You know, he's the guy who wrote the, the Bible for us, yep. Bob Bobrowski. And he had done a complete overhaul and charged them uh, of the town of Agawam of their bylaws just a couple of years ago. And someone put it online on a PDF, and I actually have it. And I thought to myself, "Hmm, this is perfect. We can take this, can yeah. see what he add, you know, what he changed, and go through and take what we want out of it. And then we can look at the condo issue. I know that they're they're looking to add the marijuana issue, and so we can maybe go start there, and then go forward right. uh, with some suggestions. And they have yeah. to all be voted into the town board anyway, right? And obviously, right. nobody's got any copyright on uh, some other town's bylaw, right? Right. Right. I mean, I, also going into that, it would probably be a joint committee of a couple of us and a couple of people on the planning board would probably be better so that we're not just repeating and chasing each other. Might be nice if we could put together, like have our own committee and kind of get it started, like and mm -hmm. maybe, you know, kind of put some ideas together of things we want to change and then, and then we should contact them and get the liaison or two and meet together. You know, I think it's a good point, David. I'm sorry. Let's give it some thought. So that we do end up with a cutting edge bylaw, right? Yeah, and you can do it like it should be happening every year. Like you could be making small updates and cleaning things up. Like just go through all these meetings. You see how many like dead ends there are and how many broken pieces and that's just natural for bylaws. It's so hard to, it's so hard to write a good zoning section of a bylaw. I, I've, I've tried to do it in swaps and like, you, you get to one word that can mean three different things and it confuses a sentence and it's painful and and we see it come up as we as we look at as we interpret the bylaw. So we're probably the best people for it. Does there exist a uh, a statewide model bylaw? There are. Peter, I'm not Peter, I'm Michael. I don't know if you've ever looked at CPTC, Citizen Planning and Training. I haven't Office. seen it, no, right. Um, it's a group that works out of Western Mass that does all education for planners and zoning boards, planning and zoning boards. And they're incredible. It's like an MCLE of right. zoning and planning. Right. So, and they're really good. And they're the ones who did our training for us in the past. They did what? people out. And they're going to do it again. Oh, training, yeah. Training, yeah. So um, they're really cool. Look them up. I'll send you a link if you like in a couple minutes. Great. Uh, and then we can, the next time we meet, maybe we can talk about what, doing that as a committee and stuff like that. Oh, dang. dang. Everybody likes it. Yep. Well, I just know I thought about some stuff for thought, future thought. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> He's always thinking that, David. You know, <laughs> right. Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. So now, will you entertain a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Go ahead. I'll
I'll second it. All right, Peter Barber made the motion. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All say aye. 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 Thank you. Good to talk to you all. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.